All right, um, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, we're really glad to have you with us today as we dig into our recently released report, um, Recommendations for Recycled Content, Requirements for Plastic Goods and Packaging at the National Level um, in the US. And just a heads up that um, we are recording the webinar today. Um, do feel free to send in your questions in the Q&A box. We will keep those anonymous. Um, and so feel free to ask anything you like, but um, just know that we are recording. And so uh, if we can go to the next slide. So we're going to spend about 35 minutes or so presenting today. Um, we're gonna spend some time um, giving you a little bit of background and some context. Not everybody uh, may naturally think of an ocean organization um, putting out a report on recycled content. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the why. Um, and then of course, we're gonna dig into the report itself before we turn to your questions and comments. Um, so there will be three of us presenting today. Uh, Shever Voltmer is uh, director of our plastics initiatives here at Ocean Conservancy. Um, myself, Edith Cicchini, I'm project director for corporate strategy and policy um, here at OC. And I also lead our consortium of um, companies and conservation organizations in um, something called the Trash Free Seas Alliance, which you'll hear us talk a little bit more about later. Um, and so Chevron and I spearheaded this report here at OC, and we were lucky to get the chance to work with the Resource Recycling uh, Systems, or RRS, team, including the lead author of the report, who's our third speaker today, uh, Risa Domino. Um, we also have some other RRS staff here today, too, including Ann Johnson and Marissa Adler, who were really highly engaged. So um, a big shout out to RRS for all the work that went into the report. And so next slide, please. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Ocean Conservancy, we are celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. Uh, we're based in Washington, DC. We have offices um, in other parts of the United States as well. We're a nonprofit ocean conservation and advocacy organization. So we have a lot of program areas outside of plastics, including conservation work in the Arctic and Florida, fisheries management, ocean planning, climate, um, working to prevent lost and abandoned fishing gear. And of course, we have our amazing cleanup team that's been organizing millions of volunteers um, all around the world to clean up beaches and water rays, uh, waterways for over 35 years. Um, and we also have a lot of scientists and wonky uh, policy type folks too. So um, the, these, th this is how we really try to ensure that our advocacy efforts are knowledge-based. And so that science and policy focus is a really big part of our work particularly in the Trash Free Seas Alliance. So we can go to the next um, slide. We're gonna warm you all up with a couple of uh, polls just to kind of see uh, where folks are on this topic. So the first one, if we can get that one queued up, is how much do you know about recycled content standards? Do you consider yourself an expert? Do you know enough to be dangerous? Or are you just here to learn? And so we'll give everybody um, you know, just about 10 seconds or so to answer that. All right, should we check the results? Okay, so most people know enough to be dangerous and then a little bit uh, mixed either way, okay? And then for the next one, if we can close that one out, the next one is, does your organization have a policy position on recycled content standards? Yes, in favor, yes, opposed, not yet, or no, we do not advocate for policy. All right, and let's close that one out and see the results. Okay, wow, so we definitely have um, some in favor. 
and then kind of a mixed bag. All right, very good. Thanks, everybody. Really great to see that. So let's go on to the next slide if we can. All right, so I'm gonna share um, some stats here. The, the, the stats that you see on the screen, they're really just a, a small sample of the research and data that show that our ocean really needs us to solve the problem of plastic pollution. So that first one, 11 million metric tons entering the ocean each year. It's a really big number, but to help you kind of visualize it, we always, uh, we, we say, imagine a garbage truck dumping a full load of plastics into the ocean every single minute. Um, it's actually about one and a half garbage trucks per minute, but it helps you to kind of understand the estimated amount that's getting into the ocean each year. We also know that there are lots of marine species that are um, have been very well documented to ingest or become entangled in plastic and have a high likelihood of, of doing so. And often, you know, that often creates death. And so there are real impacts to biodiversity, um, not only from the plastic that is out there in the ocean and in the waterways, but also from the extractive activities associated with fossil fuels, which is um, kind of ties into the next point on, on the climate side realizing that 99% of plastics come from fossil fuels. You know, the stats that we've seen are that by 2050, both the plastic going into the ocean and the emissions from the industry are forecasted to triple. Um, there's also increasing concern around micro and nanoplastics in our bodies um, and um, the, the impacts of, of that on human health potentially are still being studied. And then finally, we know it's costly from a financial perspective that governments spend billions of dollars, you know, cleaning up beaches, cleaning out their stormwater systems um, where plastics can create clogs. Um, and then obviously that it can in in impact coastal communities from livelihoods and so on. So these are some of the really tough but very real consequences that we see in our work here at Ocean Conservancy that are caused by plastic. Um, these are things that we're tracking and that we want to do something about. So let me turn it over to Shever to kind of take it from here about um, on just that very topic. So Shever, over to you. Thank you, Edith. And I wanna recognize all of the work that Edith did to put this report together, as well as Risa and Anya Brandon, who um, helped to do a lot of the fact-checking of our work, who can be here today. So uh, even though Ocean Conservancy organizes the world's biggest trash cleanup, in 2018, just prior to the onset of the global pandemic, we mobilized more than 1 million people to pick up trash in a single day. At some point we realized that we were never gonna solve this problem with cleanups alone. So that led to the founding of the Trash Free Seas Alliance 10 years ago, which Edith oversees. And our volunteers record every item they collect from our cleanups, and that informs our approach to policy. So one trend that came through very starkly in this data is the rising prevalence of plastic trash, which, which increased to the point that for the past few years, most or all of the top 10 items most commonly found on beaches globally were plastic, much of it single use. So this isn't the first time that we looked at some of the policy drivers like recycled content as possible solutions to this problem. So, you know, as we think about the work that we did in 2019, Ocean Conservancy and the Trash Free Seas Alliance commissioned a report in collaboration with Accenture to analyze all of the different policies that could have the highest impact on ocean plastic pollution. We started with over 80 policy options and ran them through a rigorous set of filters and analysis to determine their, their, their contribution to reducing plastic leakage. Extended producer responsibility and recycled content standards rose to the top. And they won't fix everything, but they have the potential to have huge bang for the buck, especially if implemented together. So that same year, the second Save Our Seas legislation was drafted, which is known by the shorthand SOS 2.0. And Ocean Conservancy, along with many of our Trash Free Seas Alliance members, were instrumental in lobbying for the passage of that bill. It took 18 months, but it was signed into law at the very end of 2020. So there's a lot in the bill, but we identified a couple of things that we could use to help drive the continued or to continue to drive the conversation forward. So in particular, the law requires the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, to report to Congress on things like the economic and technical feasibility of recycled content standards and potential end markets. So you know, in February of, of last year, so just over a year ago, 
Several of our Trash Free Seas Alliance members stepped forward to offer their insight on the report, uh, on a report on recycled content that we commissioned from RRS, whom we chose as a partner because of their incredible experience and expertise in all things recycling. And our aim is for this report to help inform not only the EPA and Congress, but all stakeholders interested in the issue. So next slide, please. So this is just a snapshot uh, regarding the current state of recycling in the United States. We know that PET and HDPE bottles are the most recycled items. And in fact, there's more demand um, than supply right now, but they are not all of the 40% of plastic packaging that enters the waste stream. And there are lots of reasons why the recycling rate remains low. Sometimes some products are just not designed to be recycled in our current system. Some products don't have an end market. Um, and some, and some, you know, the format or the resin type don't make recycling economical. We also know that almost a third of Americans lack access to automatic curbside recycling. And that was a big learning for me from this report, uh, as well as sort of ongoing and, and ongoing and massive confusion over how and what can be recycled. So all of this adds up to what we've been hearing about the inadequacy of the current recycling systems. The recycling system needs investment. We need companies to be conscious of design when they come, you know, when they think about the end of life of their products and packaging. And we need a lot more clarity and transparency about what is actually recyclable in practice, not just theory, in our many recycling systems. So next slide. So this is probably my favorite slide in, in the presentation because it really talks about why recycling, recycled content standards matter. And the report really illuminated a number of benefits that recycled content standards can have. And the first and most obvious is that it reduces the, am the amount of virgin plastic needed, which is overwhelmingly a fossil fuel based feedstock. So in turn, this reduces the impact on biodiversity from extraction, it reduces greenhouse gas emissions, um, which we'll share more on momentarily, and increased recycling um, reduces material flows into landfills and incinerators. So it has major environmental benefits. From an economic perspective, it helps improve the recycling system by providing some stability in the market, ensuring demand, um, which then encourages investment. And recycled content mandates also reduce waste management costs. So it's a critical component of a circular economy, which will be a driver for jobs in the future. And if done right, the playing field for companies will be level instead of just the handful of companies now trying to improve their environmental footprint by sourcing recycled content. You know, with mandates, all companies in a sector would be subject to the same requirements regardless of the price of virgin. Next slide, please. So our, these charts uh, demonstrate the significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from three common, commonly used plastics, and you can see that the emissions are roughly a third for recycled content versus virgin. And the energy required to make virgin PET is about 80% more than recycled PET and nearly 90% more for HDPE and, and polypropylene. So this is a major win for the environment. Next slide, please. So um, another interesting finding out of this report is that the, the US recycling system has the capacity to recycle more plastic although that capacity is more heavily concentrated in the Eastern half of the United States. But there are a lot of challenges that exist when it comes to um, mandating recycled content. So one of those is um, recycle of content standards drive demand as companies meet those mandates by sourcing more recycled material. Um, but the major finding, one of the major findings of our report is that to optimize the impact of recycled content mandates, they need to be paired with complementary policies aimed at increasing supply. So policies like extended re producer responsibility or EPR mandated in parallel or even before PCR mandates will help accomplish this. Uh, another major finding is that not all plastics are the same um, or not all plastics are equal when it comes to end markets. So end markets have not been developed as strongly for some types of plastic, um, which remain um, dependent on the price of virgin. Uh, it's not a huge surprise, but reducing confusion over what is recyclable and increasing consumer participation remain big challenges. And this is one that I think impacts everyone. Even I, who spend my life thinking about this, I'm often stuck standing in front of the bin wondering if I can recycle something. 
Uh, we've touched on packaging design uh, a little bit already, but obviously that continues to challenge the system. We need more design for recycling. Uh, um, another interesting um, item from the report is, is about innovation and sorting technology. Um, we expect that to continue. We hope to see more uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, and things like digital watermarks coming into play to make recycling easier and sorting easier. And then finally, um, another major challenge continues to be around ensuring food grade plastics remain uncontaminated and of high quality. So with that, I'll turn it over to Risa to um, go into some of the more technical aspects of the report um, and uh, we'll keep going. Thanks, Shever, and thanks to all of you for coming out today. We're very pleased to be a part of this report. Um, I'll just jump very deeply into the wonky economics of recycling. One of the things that people um, often, uh, uh, you know, that we need to understand going into these discussions is that municipal recycling doesn't function like a conventional supply demand market. So. Um, people often say, well, if the materials were just worth more, if you just pay, if they just were higher value by establishing things like minimum recycle content, um, more would be collected for recycling. And that's not entirely true. Um, and that is because the, um, the price signals in the marketplace don't reach all the way to the municipality and the consumer who's making the decision to recycle. Um, and so these folks, um, you know, are not operating as sort of conventional economic actors. So what you see happen um, in a situation where there is high demand for a recycled material and a high price paid by brands and retailers to use that recycled material in an end product is, um, you know, that brand and retailer will pay um, pay a good price to a converter to get them that recycled material. That converter will pay the reclaimer the plastic reclaimer for that PCR, that post-consumer recycled content. Um, the reclaimer will pay the MRF. Um, so those are very strong and direct economic signals that go as far as a municipal recycling facility. Um, but then um, that municipal, the, the, the municipal recycling facility or the MRF may or may not share the revenue from that material with the municipality. Um, they, uh, that depends on the type of agreement that the MRF and the municipality have. Um, even if they do share that revenue with the municipality, it's not revenue the municipality can rely on um, because uh, commodity markets are cyclical and um, they're never sure whether or not they're gonna get that return. Um, and adding to that is the fact that plastics make up maybe um, you know eight percent or so of the municipal recycling stream. So even if those prices are high, they're not driving um, that the uh, the pricing and the the value of the municipal recycling stream as a whole. Um, so the municipality in this in this uh, system really typically sees itself not as uh, the entity that's sitting on the beginning of an industrial supply chain. They really see themselves as a service provider. Um, they are, are there to provide curbside recycling service to their residents and their job is to make sure that material gets picked up and delivered somewhere. They're not necessarily thinking of themselves as, again, the beginning of that supply chain. Um, and there is little or no financial incentive to the consumer who is the one who actually makes the decision on whether or not to put a material in the bin versus in, in um, the trash can. So um, again, very long way of saying not a conventional supply and demand market, increasing the value of recyclables on their own will not increase the supply of materials available. So to Shever's point, we really do need to look at um, supply side policies like extended producer responsibility, mandatory recycling, beverage container deposits. We need to look at them in concert with the very effective demand side policy um, that the mandatory minimum recycle content standards provide. Um, looking into how recycled plastics are used these days, this, um, this uh, 
graph here shows the end uses for the various different packaging resins that we looked at in the report. Um, and what you can see here is that most of the um, recycled plastic packaging, uh, most of the pack plastic packaging that's recycled is used in a durable or long-term end product. So whether that's a pail, a bucket, a pallet, um, or something of that nature, lumber, um, if it's polyethylene or polypropylene, or carpet fiber or textiles, if it's PET. Um, we do see some packaging to packaging um, recycling in the more mature markets. Those are for recycled PET and recycled HDPE. Um, but uh, in, in the recycled PET market, which is the most mature, um, we are seeing uh, for the first time packaging end uses overtaking the more durable end uses like fiber um, in terms of the amount used. So there, for in 2020, for the first time ever, there was more RPET used in, um, in uh, bottle applications and packaging applications than in fiber. So um, that's according to the NAPCOR report. We should also acknowledge that a lot of the data that we used in this report and this analysis comes from NAPCOR, comes from the Association of Plastic Recyclers, um, comes from Stina and other sources. And so we're really grateful to have um, all this information to draw from. Um, but the key point here is that while there's some packaging to packaging recycling happening um, in the more mature markets, a lot of recycled plastic is going into durable markets. Um, and that is because those end uses are more able to handle the type of plastics that are moving through the recycling system today. They can handle the quality of material that's coming from our curbside programs, the mix of colors um, and that sort of thing uh, it, that goes into those applications. So as we shift to thinking about um, how to develop good mandatory minimum recycled content standards, it's key, um, the sort of best practices is to look at these key areas. So first, what items are you gonna include and what items are you gonna exempt? It's important to really define that clearly to ensure that um, the programs are effective and driving the markets that you really wanna influence. What recycled content types are gonna be allowable? If you're using re recycled content standards to support municipal recycling program markets, you really wanna focus on post-consumer content um, because you wanna make sure that the material you're creating demand for is the material coming through those municipal programs. The rates and dates are key. How much are you gonna require people to use and by when? Um, another best practice is to allow for portfolio level standards. So if you have a 25% um, recycled content requirement for um, PET beverage bottles, um, it's good practice to allow the producers to meet that standard across their portfolio. There may be one type of container where it's, it's um, workable for them to incorporate 100% recycled content and others where it's more challenging. So um, ultimately we wanna get that material used. And so if the most effective way to, for them to do that is to spread that 25% overall across their portfolio, it's good policy to allow them to do that. Um, it's also important to incorporate verification and reporting. Um, whether it's third party or auditing or some manner of verification, um, that's going to be key to the effectiveness here. Um, it's also a good practice to look at applying, allowing for waivers, but you need to be really careful about defining what kind of waivers are going to be acceptable um, and in what conditions they can be used. So if you saw the New Jersey law that passed earlier this year, um, you can apply for a waiver if there's not sufficient supply of material. We've talked a lot about today about the, the, the um, need to move supply and demand in concert. Um, if the supply isn't available, um, you know, in that, that state, you could apply for a waiver against the requirement, um, allowing that kind of a flexibility um, is important, um, but, but creating that base with a strong standard is also key. Um, and then lastly, reporting and enforcement, good standards on what needs to be reported and clarity on 
who is going to enforce and how um, is key. So those are the key um, elements of um, a strong and effective minimum recycle content standard. And now we'll look at what are some of the levels that we think make some sense. So let me um, explain first here. We have three tables here. The first one is um, largely the durable products um, at, that we um, have identified as key end users of um, recycled plastic. And so what we're suggesting here is under any scenario, we need to continue to move a lot of the material that's going through our system into these durable applications that are ready and able to utilize the materials that our recycling programs are currently generating. Um, that creates the base load, the baseline to keep materials moving through the system. You can see in most cases, these levels are fairly flat as we go forward in years, because if you look at the, the tables below, table two and table three, we're suggesting that we do want to see increases in the use of recycled content, but we want to see those increases happen on the, um, in the more circular applications and the packaging applications. So what you see in um, table two is a scenario where um, we are uh, experiencing pretty significant growth in recycling collection um, and processing. So we're increasing that supply, assuming that a number of the states that are currently considering deposits or um, EPR are successful and that moves forward and we have some additional supply and some uh, the technolog technological innovations um, that are, are um, coming online now will come to fruition. Um, we the, the levels in table two are what we would recommend as aggressive but achievable. Table three really looks at what if we had national best in class recycling collection. So really broad application of supply side policy, national EPR, national beverage container deposit, where could we get in terms of PCR standards? And that's what we've laid out um, in table three. Um, so that gives you the sense. So again, we want to keep um, you know, that these markets for um, the durable products, accepting a lot of the sort of lower value, lower quality material that's regularly moving through our stream. We want to stabilize those through the UCD's content standards and then add standards for packaging that increase over time. And I think now it's back to you, Edith. Great, thanks so much, Risa. Um, so I just wanna uh, give another reminder that we're about to wrap up. So if you have uh, questions, please do put them into the Q&A box and we will do our best to, to get to um, all of them today. Um, so just to kind of close out from the report here, um, you know, we hope that the report shows that establishing Minimum PCR standards is important to achieving uh, a circular economy for plastics. And obviously while recognizing the challenges, there really is an urgency to work towards their, you know, more their imp implementation more broadly. Um, so the roadmap here calls for investment and policy to increase the supply through improved collection, as well as greater government purchasing requirements for items made with PCR. Um, that was something that we didn't delve into today, but it is in the report, um, along with some other um, ideas for, um, you know, what can be done in the meantime, but we do think that government purchasing requirements is, is definitely something to look at. Um, and then obviously the, the implementation of, of requirements for PCR soon thereafter. So um, this kind of overarching roadmap is, kind of showing the ongoing need for companies to assess their problematic materials, encourage reuse, um, and also for us to ensure that there's funding for innovation and system improvement. So plenty to be done. Um, and we hope that that you found, uh, you know, this kind of overview really helpful. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, I definitely want to be sure, you know, that we thank the contributors. So there are several folks um, in the acknowledgement page of the report that provided um, really great insights and input. 
um, to the report. There's also many who we just spoke to privately who are not listed there. So just want to give a shout out to many members of our Trash Free Seas Alliance, but also um, across the, the kind of recycling ecosystem and value chain um, for, for contributing to the report. You obviously made it um, much more valuable. So thank you for that. And then we'll move to the last slide and we'll start with questions. So please um, do send those in as you, um, as you have them. So we do have one, um, and this is something we, di we didn't touch on but um, too much, but uh, what is the approach for flexible films? So maybe Risa, we'll start with you for that one and Shevra, feel free to chime in. Sure, and um, so I was just typing an answer to that. So good, save my fingers a minute. Um, yeah, so the the uh, given that the report is focused on uh, mandatory minimum recycle content standards, we recommended minimum content standards for um, the flexible films for which there are existing recovery pathways and networks. So we have um, we're recommending content standards for trash bags and also retail bags. So it's polyethylene film focused. This report did not go into pathways for recovery of materials that are not, um, not currently sorted for recycling like polypropylene films, which was the prior question asked by, um, by that participant. So we focused, because it's focused on minimum content standards, we really looked at what are the technologies that are available now that you know end uses that can use material that are moving that is moving through the system now and so we focused on those where there are pretty proven um uh, technologies and capabilities to move content great um so next question do your calculations for recycled content allow for the contribute for the continuation of existing non-bottle end uses. Yes, they do. And that's part of, um, you know, when we calculated the, the increases over time, we assumed that the current non-packaging end uses would continue essentially at their current rates. We didn't do a lot of analysis to look at, um, you know, potential growth in the non-packaging scenarios. Um, it was a bit of a static analysis, but we did assume that the, the existing end uses that are not packaging continue. And, um, and so any increase in packaging to packaging requires essentially additional collection and recycling. Great, thanks, Risa. So um, here's one for Shover. Uh, what other policies has OSH Conservancy considered to help reduce plastic in the environment? So <laughs> how much time do you have? <laughs> Thanks. Yes, I'll, I'll be brief. Thank you, Edith. So um, we have looked, as I said before, at a full range of policies. We started with 80. We then sort of consolidated them into sort of like-minded policies that we ended up with about 42. And then we ran them through this, as I said, very rigorous filter um, and ended up with about 24 policies that we thought could make a difference and contribute to the solution for marine debris. The top of the list was um, extended producer responsibility with recycled content standards coming in as a close second. But the other interesting piece that we did, we did a little bit of modeling to look at the combined impact of policies together. So um, the single most um, impactful, I hate that word, but the, the, the biggest impact came from putting extended producer responsibility and recycled content standards together. That said, um, other, other, me other mechanisms such as um, deposit return schemes and other ones also play a part. And I think Risa, you had a, a pretty good list, so you might want to sort of reiterate that. Um, but yes, um, many policies, but starting with the ones that will have the biggest bang for the buck. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I mentioned also mandatory recycling, which is um, uh, takes a, a number of different um, sort of pathways, but is in place and it has been effective when implemented properly. Um, and I think the best performing programs on the supply side combine EPR and beverage container deposits. Um, and again, if you couple that with the demand side recycle content standards, it's a very powerful package. Lisa, can you talk a little bit more about mandatory recycling in 
if you know of any states or municipalities where that has worked. Yeah, the, the two, um, there's a lot of states that say they have mandatory recycling and mandatory recycling means a lot of different things, right? You can require um, uh, every resident in the state to recycle. You can require in New York state, our mandatory recycling requires that every municipality have a law that requires that its residents recycle. Um, uh, but I think the two most effective uh, mandatory recycling laws I've seen in the US are in Vermont and in Delaware. And in um, both of those cases, the, um, the service provider, whoever's picking up your garbage is required to also offer recycling services. So it's a, a universal recycling combined with a mandatory recycling. So a mandate lacking service doesn't do very much, but if you're able to do um, that service requirement, um, you know, you can you can be very effective. And uh, the data in both of those states shows it's it's um, fairly strong. In Vermont, it's also coupled with disposal bans and some other sort of wraparound policies, the use of pay as you throw and other tools. Um, in Delaware, uh, Delaware is obviously a tiny state. They have one MRF, they have one landfill. Um, and it's all private service. So it's fairly um, you know, contained. And the way they work the system there is they require all of the private service providers to provide every one of their customers with recycling as well as garbage service and provide it at a bundled rate. So the consumer is paying for the recycling service, but they're not seeing it as an additional cost. It's all rolled together. So the service provider can charge what they need to to make it work. The resident or the business um, pays that cost and, and um, it's available universally throughout the state. Lots of different models out there. It's hard to keep track of them all. I love that you can just spout that off so easily. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so another question more along the lines of data. So the report shows there are um, several charts that include data from Canada, and we tried to make sure that we labeled that clearly for folks. Um, so can you elaborate a little bit more about why we included data from Canada? Yeah, so um, in terms of plastic recycling, Canada and the US essentially effectively operate as one market. Materials are collected in one country, processed in another, and vice versa. So when you see the reports out, the, the reports I mentioned earlier, whether they're from APR or from NAPCOR, um, when they report on end uses or you know, how much material is, is used, they report that for both the US and Canada because the person who makes a bottle in Michigan might get some of their recycled PET pellet from the US and some from Canada, and they're not going to report that separately to NAPCOR. Um, and so, uh, so those end use data include what's generated in both. Um, but the collection recycling rate data is all US specific. Does that make sense? Did I explain that right? I It made sense to me. Hopefully it made sense to everybody. I think it did. Um, but we're happy to, to answer any follow-up questions on that one. Um, so another one that's come in is, you know, there are states that have um, set ambitious recycled content rates for specific uh, materials. And so why would a national PCR rate uh, national recycled content standard rates uh, be lower than some of the more ambitious um, numbers that are already out there. So California, of course, comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And it's a good question and one that we, we've been asked before, but I'll open that up to um, you and then if she ever wants to chime in. Sure. So um, remember, we talked about the fact that we have a supply challenge, that there's not enough material um, being collected for recycling um, today to meet uh, some of the, certainly the corporate commitments and the, the existing demand for recycled content. Um, and if you look throughout the country, there are large swaths of the country where there's very little recycling that happens at all in the Southeast, um, in the Western states. And so if you take the highest content standard 
um, a California content standard, which is drawing from materials from a state that has a very well developed collection and public collection infrastructure has a container deposit on all beverages It functions at a pretty high rate, very, very strong supply side policy generating a lot of material. If you take that kind of number and you apply it across the US, we just don't have enough material to meet that content level. There's not enough being collected in Texas or Florida or Oklahoma or those kinds of places to generate the kind of material you would need to meet those high standards nationally. So the numbers we have in the report are pretty uh, carefully thought out in terms of what's reasonable um, given where policy and where supply, where the supply is today. Um, and that's why we put that, um, you know, that, that third table in there that sort of gives you best in class. If you really were able to develop a better than California collection system nationwide, here's where you could go. Great. Thank, thanks, Risa. Um, Shevard, was there anything you wanted to chime in there? Yeah, I'll just add that this was probably um, one of the topics we talked about the most as we were putting this report together. And Risa, she's smiling because she remembers because we're an environmental mental NGO, right? So we wanted to push for ambition in recycling. And so um, I think RS was very patient in explaining to us, well, you can't recycle what you don't have and what you don't collect, right? Really, it comes down to that simple sort of bottom line. And so um, we did look at a, a best in class and we wanted to sort of think about, you know, do a thought experiment. If we could really collect everything that, that we put out, how much better could we do to really spark that policy conversation? So I'm gonna maybe combine a couple that have come in or that are, that are similar. Um, so we know there are technical limitations to using recycled content and food grade packaging. Trevor touched on that in a, in a a high level way in one of our slides. So maybe we could talk a little bit more about the, the food grade packaging piece. And then that kind of ties into another question around, you know, do we think mechanical recycling can meet these aggressive targets um, considering the technical issues with food grade plastics? So um, the, the, well, take kind of PET out of the picture for a moment. There's a lot of food grade PET recovery happening. Um, it's the most mature, it's the easiest to do. All virgin PET is food grade. And so um, the process of producing food grade um, PCR is, I don't wanna use the word simple cause it's not at all simple, but, um, but a little bit more straightforward in that it's mostly technology based. But when you move into um, the polyethylenes or the polypropylenes, in addition to having the technology that gets the material clean enough to be used in food again, you have to ensure that the material, the, the package when it was um, created was using food grade resin. So that's not always the case. There are sometimes additives, there's sometimes a different grade of resin used and that sort of thing. So um, the process of getting high density polyethylene, um, polyethylene film and uh, polypropylene back to food grade is greater. Um, so you need to do some source control. So if you, if you see there are um, uh, reclaimers that are producing food grade high density polyethylene today, they mostly do that using um, natural high density polyethylene most of that is milk jugs, as we know, and water bottles. And so they have some front end sorting capability to make sure that, that the materials going into the process are food grade. Um, and then uh, some technical processes to make sure that it's clean enough and usable for, for food grade applications. Um, so one issue is the source control. How do you know what's coming in? How do you sort for that? MRFs are not gonna do that. Um, they don't have the time, they don't have the space, they don't have the capability. So the reclaimer really has to do that. The other issue is just aesthetics and color. Um, if you look at a stream like polypropylene, there's lots of different colors and lots of different types that are coming through. So first, is it food grade? And second, when you mix it all together, is it gonna make something black um, or a, a color that's really 
um, you know, not as attractive or useful from the, from the packaging standpoint. Um, so uh, there is color sorting for both HDPE and I think is going to grow. That would be my prediction. Color sorting of polypropylene is going to grow, um, you know, to pull out some of that white material and to do more of that sorting to get to food grade. Um, but there is no question that um, if there is a role for chemical recycling um, in this marketplace, it is in things like the system used by PureCycle, a purification technology that can take that mixed color, um, uh, varying and use polypropylene and uh, clean it and purify it to a virgin-like material. Um, so uh, do we assume in the recommendations that some of that will happen? Yes, we do. Would I say that it's impossible for mechanical recycling to meet those demands? I don't think it's impossible. I do think it's very challenging. And so there's going to be a question as to whether how the market responds and how the investments take place. Um, I do want to take the opportunity to draw a distinction between the technologies like Pure Cycle, which is a purification technology, like um, the technology uh, used by Reterra, which is a, a, a PET depolymerization technology. Um, Want to draw a distinction between those chemical processes that purify and, and um, depolymerize resins and the the gasification and pyrolysis technologies that use heat and pressure break down further. Um, and I think there's that there needs to be a distinction drawn between those types of technologies and what's uh, what role each of them plays as we move forward. Maybe just to add there, um, Risa. So this was another subject of great discussion amongst the team that put this report out, um, how to factor in innovation, both for mechanical and other things you know, going out into the future. So there are things that we know that are already in the pipeline for improving mechanical recycling. But when you're talking about the timelines that we're looking at, you know, decades, we also frankly assume that there are things that we don't necessarily know about today that will come online um, over time to improve both mechanical and potentially other kinds of recycling. Yeah, anytime you're trying to project out into the future, it can get tricky, but, um... Yeah, I think we, we did the best we could with those. Um, this is for both of you, I think, to chime in. And it's a big, it's, it's a big one, I guess. Um, we talk about lots of challenges, um, but if you had to pick one to two of the biggest barriers for manufacturers of plastics in particular um, in using recycled content, so whether it's in um, products or packaging, what would you say maybe are one of the, one or two of the biggest barrier barriers? Is it contamination, economics, technology limitations, or something else? So I'll throw this one out there for however you want to answer it. Um, I mean, I think just to say it again, supply, 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 which I think impacts the economics um, and also quality. I, so I think it's it's volume, price, quality, um, all of those, all of those challenges, all of which would be improved with more supply and better supply investments on the collection and processing side to improve the quantity and the quality of material collected. So Risa is the technical expert and I'm the policy wonk. So I'll come at it from a slightly different lens, which is that, you know, I think perhaps this, this problem is overcomplicated in a way that it doesn't necessarily mean to be. And this is where policy can make a difference, right? We have so many different kinds of plastic and we feel like we have to solve that equation for each and every one. But I also think there's a lot that can be done from the policy side to sort of simplify and mandate what we do, how we use plastic, what we use it for and what kinds of plastic we use that could probably make this problem a lot easier to solve. So I will, I will come at it from a totally different angle than Risa. And that's, that's why we have both, right? We have the, the data that's out there on the technical side and then the, the policy pieces. That's what makes us all come together, hopefully to work. Um, I'll tr I think we'll probably wrap up with this last question unless I see um, any more squeak through here at the end, but I think we've gotten through most, if not all of them. Um, but so there was a case study in the 
report on the rigid plastic packaging law in California. We didn't go into it today, but um, maybe you know, starting with Risa again, could you share a little bit more about some of the learnings from that law as kind of the the one we we hold up as an as an example in the report? Yeah, it's um, it's really interesting, and I was I was excited to get to write that up because if you run in the plastic recycling circles, you hear people say, um, you know, how critical that RPPC law was in really creating the infrastructure to recycle HDPE packaging. Um, it was the demand created by that law that led to the development of, of many of the companies that are now leaders in the HDPE recycling industry um, and, uh, and really developed the technologies that moved us forward. And um, so just to, to see the basics, the RPPC law requires certain plastic packaging um, to contain 25% uh, recycled content or meet other standards, the other standards not achievable. So uh, reverted to the, the, the plastic, uh, the recycled content standard. It doesn't apply to food packaging. Um, so it does apply to certain PET packaging and it has been an important baseline. If you look at the Napa Core reports over the years, there's always been a little bit of RPET going to, non-food bottles, and that is the demand from the California RPPC law that has been consistent for decades. Um, and But in HDPE, there's much more HDPE used in non-food markets, so it's been much more significant um, in that marketplace. So it's created a stable business environment that allowed people to come in and invest. It has provided a basic price support in that market through some very lean times and some very challenging economics. One of the things we haven't talked about is the fact that low virgin resin prices make it very difficult for recycled plastics to compete on the market um, uh, and, uh, and make it challenging from the producer side, frankly, to say, okay, we, we want to recycle so much that we're going to pay a premium to do so. Um, and so at times when HDPE virgin prices dropped really low, that demand that was required from the California law was critical in keeping those companies afloat. And um, so it really can't be overstated how important that law has been um, in supporting that market. Maybe I would just add a couple of other points that were illuminating for me about that case study. And one thing is that it gets you to the target, but it doesn't get you too far above it, right? right. So I think that helps to make the case for increasing ambition over time. And then the other piece from that case study that really stuck with me as the non-technical expert is that it really illustrated this idea of drawing in supply from broader markets. So if, if California were an island, right, it probably wouldn't have worked. You needed the bigger market to meet those targets. And so that really gets back to some of those bigger challenges with the market in the US. So that, that would be the two things as a non-technical expert that I kind of learned from that case study. Yeah, I think that's very true. They definitely drew material nationally and also supported the development of that recycling infrastructure nationally to all of our benefit. Great, well, we, um, we're gonna close out with one final poll. Um, so I don't know if we can queue up that last one. So do we need recycled content standards at the national level? We'll just give everyone a few seconds to answer. All right, I think that's enough time. Let's see for those who answered what the results are. All right, very good. So maybe is, is a, coming in around 30% and 70% yes, and nobody selected no. So I think we did our job today. <laughs> um, very good. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us um, and for everybody who I know registered and, and couldn't be here for watching it, this later. Big thanks to Shever, Risa, and also our colleague, um, Anya, as Shever mentioned, who was a big part of this and the, the whole RRS team. So um, thanks for all the work on this and thank you to um, everyone for, for participating today. Have a good rest of the day. Thanks everyone. Thank